All right. Hey, everyone. My name is Kevin Grigorenko. I'm a software engineer on the IBM App Platform SWAT team, which includes Webster Application Server. And we'll be talking about how to analyze Java out of memory errors. So let's go to the next slide. So I like to start off a presentation with the summary of the whole you know, presentation. So what are you going to learn today? First of all, Java out of memory errors are one of the top five issues that our customers face. They often cause either errors for transactions, poor performance, uh, crashes. And one thing that customers sometimes don't understand is happening, but it hits them pretty hard is when a JVM is near out of memory, it may actually never go out of memory, but it'll spend most of its time garbage collecting and it can enter a zombie-like state. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Now, as far as what causes out of memory, there are a lot of causes. Obviously, the maximum heap size is a common cause if it's too small for the workload. If there are too many threads, if application memory usage is too high, if there's some runaway thread asking for too much you know, data from a database, for example, large caches can um, use too much memory, memory leaks, if you have too many HTTP sessions. And then we'll also talk a little bit about native out of memories. And then as far as investigating the causes of the, all of those, the first step is to review garbage collection. We'll talk about that. And on IBM and OpenJ9 Java, we'll talk about Java cores and how they help understand what caused the out of memory. Then of course, you need to make sure you get all of the diagnostics. This is especially a concern in cloud and container environments. And then finally, we'll talk about how to actually review the heap dump, which will let you understand what caused the out of memory using the free Eclipse memory analyzer tool. So some a little bit of background theory. If we start at the right image, imagine that entire box is the Java process. It's the whole virtual address space from an operating system point of view. And for the purposes of this presentation, there are really three classes of memory. And if we start in the middle, we've got the Java heap. You know, ultimately, the Java heap is just a native, huge native chunk of memory or a couple chunks of memory. And that, of course, has all of your Java objects. That's what we're mostly used to dealing with. Then if you look down the third box, we have in the 0 to 4 gigabyte virtual address uh, space range, we have native structures that back some of the structures in the Java heap. So specifically classes, threads, and monitors. This is assuming that you have compressed references enabled um, on hotspots called compressed uh, oops. And this is usually enabled unless your heap size is really large, over 25 gigs or so, um, depending on your version of Java, it can go a little bit higher as well, uh, or you've explicitly disabled it for some reason. But assuming the majority of cases, the um, native structures for compressed references to work, the native structures backing classes, threads, and monitors must go in the zero to four gigabyte virtual address space range. Um, and then finally, the top box, we have other native structures that need that are needed to run the JVM, the, the just-in-time compiler, uh, direct byte buffers, and operating system uh, things like thread stacks. So when you get a Java out of memory error, this is the blue top box, that's when you've run out of space in the Java heap that you can't, the JVM can't make space available for what was requested. But you can also get native out of memory, and which is a bit odd, especially as we move towards 64-bit. You would think, well, I've got plenty of RAM. It's a 64-bit address space. Why would I be going out of memory? I mean, unless my RAM is, out of, is exhausted. The reason is because with compressed references, the for compressed references to work, and compressed references basically give you a performance boost, um, those structures must go into that virtual address space range. So we will focus in this presentation only on the Java heap. But so, and that is um, controlled by dash XMX or max RAM percentage. That controls the size of this box and what the JVM can play with. 
And we won't talk about native out of memories much. I'll just make a few notes because that's a whole other presentation and uses different tools. But just be aware that there can be native out of memory. Uh, we also won't be talking about actual uh, physical memory issues, such as if you've run out of RAM or you know if you're swapping. So that's again uh, something you would see at, at an operating system level. So how do you know you you've received an out of memory error? What will happen is that Java will, when it does a full garbage collection, it can't make space. It throws an out of memory error. There's a runtime exception. And then the top of the stack will either be the cause of the out of memory error or it may just be a victim. You know, Let's say that your uh, Java heap is 99% full because of some other thread or cache or leak or whatever. And then a request comes in and it just wants, you know, four bytes of memory, if the heap is completely exhausted, that will be the thread that throws the out-of-memory error. But in that case, it was just a, a victim of the cache or leak or whatever. And so you may often see in logs, you may see an out-of-memory error, um, a cause, such as Java heap space in the details of the message, and then the stack. And again, that could be the cause or a victim. Now, when this is just a normal exception, so it is a, in fact possible for applications to catch this exception, and they may do that consciously or not. You know, if they just did catch throwable, they would catch an out of memory error. So um, sometimes an out of memory error is not fatal. So let's uh, take the example of a one request comes in and it requests 500 megs from the database, some bug or whatever. Um, in that case, let's say it throws an out-of-memory error. And unless that thread is um, consuming something in the session data or something like that, the, it, and again, unless the application does something in response to the out-of-memory error, then that stack will just unwind and all that memory will be likely freed. And so it can actually go back to normal. So just because you got an out-of-memory error doesn't mean it's fatal although often it is because of GC thrashing and other reasons. Now, what do you get when an out of memory error occurs? On recent versions of IBM Java and OpenJ9, by default, for the first out of four out of memory errors for the life of each process, it will create a Java core text file, which is a small text file, a couple of megabytes that describes the all the threads that were active at the time of the out of memory. It'll create a PHD file, heap dump file, which contains information about the Java heap. Create a snap trace file, which is basically like a flight recorder of the JVM. And it will print a message to standard air on Liberty, that's console log and traditional web sphere, that's native standard air log, uh, which says that it is handling that memory error. And then it'll uh, do processing like creating the Java core and, and core dump. So if you want advanced knowledge of you know, the first signs of an out-of-memory error other than GC, then you can set up monitors for your standard error to look for these sorts of JVM messages. I su suggest just searching for capital JVM at the start of a line that will give all kinds of different potential issues in the JVM. In addition, recent versions for the first out-of-memory error for the life of each uh, JVM, the JVM will try to create a core dump, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute if the OS is properly configured for that. On hotspot Java, by default, it does not create any heap dump. You have to actually explicitly set heap dump on out of memory error, and then it will produce an hprof dump, which is kind of in between a PhD and a core dump. It, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. In general, I do recommend uh, hotspot customers set heap dump on out of memory error so that you have diagnostics to solve production issues. Now, as far as J9 core dumps, the difference between PhDs and core dumps, which are sometimes called system dumps, is that the core dump is a superset of a PhD. And more, most importantly, a core dump has accurate garbage collection root information, which gives you a very rich thread information about which thread is holding on to data and how much memory threads are consuming and what is ultimately holding certain objects. That's the, the main value of a core dump. In addition, it also includes full memory information. So if you have a string, it'll show the string contents, whereas PHD does not have memory information. So you just have the, the graph of references. 
So PhDs can find the, the proximate cause of an out of memory error. And you know, this is just kind of a gut feeling about 60% of cases. And core dumps, given enough time and effort, I have yet to find an issue uh, that I couldn't dis discover the proximate cause of using a core dump. And so what is a core dump? A core dump is an operating system core dump. Uh, this is a full dump of the virtual address space of the entire process. On Linux or Unix, this is a core, ZOS SVC dump, and Windows a mini dump. And unfortunately, there's a bit of ambiguity because we also have Java cores. Java cores are uh, just a thread dump text file. There are a few megabytes, whereas a core is a full address space dump, and there are multiple gigabytes. Usually, you can approximate it as the um, your maximum heap plus a couple hundred megabytes, although you can always just check uh, the virtual address space size in, in the OS. The major downsides to core dumps are, first of all, they, they take some configuration on Linux and, and Unix uh, with U limits, and we'll talk uh, about that next. The other major concern is security, and this, in fact, also applies to HPROF dumps. Uh, the reason is because if, let's say, a customer is running a bank transaction or whatever, at the time of the out-of-memory, the full details of everything are on the stack, all the memory of uh, any potentially private and sensitive information. So, I mean, this is nothing to do with Java. It's just the nature of operating system core dumps. And so you just have to treat them very carefully and sensitively, you know, use encryption and file access permissions as needed. On uh, Linux and Unix, you do need to, by default, most operating systems set it so that uh, core dumps are not produced. So you usually have to explicitly enable core dumps with ulimit-c unlimited. That's when you would do it in a shell script, but most customers would do it in something like a limits.com file for a user, which is a global file that configures ulimits for different users like your WebSphere user. So the first step, you got it out of memory. First step is review, at least on J9, review the Java core because you need to first know, are we dealing with a Java out of memory error or a native out of memory error? And that's really why I had that slide in the beginning. And the way to tell is that at the top of the thread dump, you can just, it's a text file, you just open it up in the first few 10 lines, you will see, first of all, the reason for the Java core, which if it's gonna be an out of memory is gonna say out of memory error. And then it'll either say Java heap space, which means Java out of memory, or it'll, basically you'd say something else. And that usually means native out of memory error. It might say native memory exhausted and be very explicit. It might be a little vague, like fail to allocate JNIN. Those are all native out of memory errors usually. They could also be ULIMIT issues, but um, if you've gotten also a heap dump in a core dump, you've gotten out of memory error. And I'll just quickly show you, I've got a little demo VM here. Here's a Java core file from an out of memory error. And you don't, again, it's a little daunting at first. There's a lot of information here, but you really just want to check that first, the, that fourth line there. And here we see we have an out of memory error and it's a Java heap space. So now we know there was a Java out of memory error. So the next step is, and I, you know, I know there's a tendency to just dive right into the heap dump, but here's why you want to take these first few steps. If the OM was caused by a very large allocation attempt, then let's say it was 500 megabytes or something like that. The resulting allocation failed and it won't, it won't actually be in the heap dump. So if you go uh, jumping right into the heap dump and the actual cause was just an out of control thread that requested hundreds of megabytes, you're looking in the wrong place. It won't be in the heap dump because it was too large to fit in. So I always start with verbose GC first. Verbose GC is verbose garbage collection. It is a very lightweight, way to dump information about garbage, the, uh, the activity of the garbage collector. And we do recommend this in general in production, has an overhead of less than 0.2% approximately. It's enabled by default in traditional WebSphere 9. And you can also enable it in Liberty and other uh, older versions of WAS. On J9, you generally use this sort of option where you say dash X for both GC log, and then the directory and the name, and then you use these to control the maximum number of files and size of the files. And on Hotspot, there's a similar option. And there are also, I didn't include here because it takes a lot of space, but there are also rolling options to limit how much disk space is used. 
And then you can either look at the verbose GC manually. It's just a XML-ish type file, or you can load into a free tool like IBM Garbage Collection Memory Visualizer. There's also the PMAT tool, and those will help you easily analyze that data. And so once you load up that data, either in text file or GCMV, then the first thing to check is first, what was leading up to the out of memory error? You might see it was a leak or something like that, or you could see it was everything was normal until there was just a big spike. And also you wanna check that first bullet point, which is what was the size of the object that led to the out of memory error? And so again, I'll quickly jump to the, to the demo here. So here this is GCMV and I've loaded the verbose GC file from an out of memory error JVM. And you can see the greenish plot, that's just the, uh, the heap size. The, you know, it's, it started as XMS was less than XMX, so it grew until it hit the max, which is about 256 megs. And then the red is the used heap after global collection. And normally this would be a sawtooth type uh, pattern, but here we can see it gets up to about 250 megs and then it just flat lines. And at that same time, I've also added the total pause time, which is this purple plot. And that's on the right Y axis of how long each garbage collection took. And you could see it, uh, a little bit before plateaus, the pause times, which are pretty low, you know, whatever, nine milliseconds. And then suddenly there's just this big spike up to hundred milliseconds, which doesn't seem too bad, but you can see the frequency of the garbage collection is also extremely high. This is a classic sign of, of right before and out of memory error, where it is spending more time garbage collecting than performing application work. And then at some point, it just becomes completely exhausted. It can't even get back uh, enough. I mean, it gets back enough to stay alive. And this is actually a, a good example of what I mentioned earlier of the zombie-like state that a JVM can get into, where from, from 909 minutes until uh, about 1055 minutes, it was actually alive, but you could see it's completely just spending all this time garbage collecting and it can't get back any memory. We should see after a garbage collection it should come down at some point, like a sawtooth, and it should come down a lot. But here we can see it's this red plot is not coming down at all. And so actually in this area for about a minute, we're GC thrashing, garbage collection thrashing. And we're, what that means is we're spending more time GCing than performing work. And so your users are already impacted here. And then at some point the JVM realizes this is just pointless and it will uh, throw what's called an excessive uh, GC out of memory error, which is uh, by default, if it's spending more than 95% of its time garbage collecting, it'll say, well, this is pointless. I, I can't, uh, over some amount of time, uh, it'll say this is pointless and I'll just throw it out of memory error. So that's what happens here. But for that minute, we were just kind of in a zombie state. And that zombie state, unfortunately, can last for a long time if you just get unlucky where the JVM can get just enough heat back to stay alive for that's less than 95% of overhead. And it can actually be there for, for hours. Now, in traditional web sphere, usually what will happen in that case is the node agent will not be able to do its ping. And then it'll decide that the JVM is, is basically dead and it'll restart it. Uh, but for other environments, you may not have something like a node agent doing that. So you do have to be aware of that. There's actually a way to tune the excessive GC ratio to say, well, let's do it at 80%, for example. So you may consider something like that. So, um, right, so this is the other thing is we wanna get back to the point of, well, was this a massive allocation or was it just, you know, the, the uh, sum of all allocations was too much. So you can either look at the raw verbose GC data and what you'll see is AF start is allocation failure start. This uh, means we tried to get memory, there was no memory, let's start a garbage collection. And it'll tell you the total bytes requested, which in this case is about um, 50 megs. So somebody requested 50 megs, which is usually too much. I mean, anything over 10 megs is suspicious. And so that may be what caused the out of memory error. And the way you can see that either you can look in the raw log or in GCMV, you can switch the data selector to VGC and requested object sizes triggering, triggering allocation failures. And then, um, so I'll just show you that real quick here. So if I switch to this, requested object sizes, and now this has added a left y-axis, which is a bit confusing. So let me get rid of the heap. 
So this is on the left y-axis here, and each one of these plots is anytime there's an allocation failure, how much was requested driving that allocation failure. And so we could see, you know, the, the, these green plots here, it's about a meg is the max, which is not great, but it's not terrible. So there was didn't seem to be anything obviously uh, spiking beforehand because we saw that a little bit earlier. And so it's in this case, it, it wasn't because of one massive allocation. And uh, this just covers what I just demoed there, which is when you see this sort of uh, phase change in both the pause times and the amount of heap that's uh, returned after garbage collection, that's when you're likely either near out of memory or out of memory. And uh, generally speaking, if the proportion of time is greater than 10%, you should be concerned. And the way to check that is you just click on the report tab here and you scroll down and this shows you the proportion of time spent garbage collection. 24% is already concerning, but actually that's because I'm looking at the whole uh, plot. Whereas you know, really we wanna look at when the pause times start to go up. So the way you do that is you change the X axis to match that moment. And then you click report again. And here we can now see proportion of times 81%. So when it started to get bad, that's when it went up to 80%, which is again, this kind of zombie-like state. And so uh, so the key point there is that if you load a verbose CC file, the, first, the initial reports for the whole file, which might be a whole day of data, but you really wanna focus in on the suspicious time. All right, so now let's say, as in this example, we've determined that the cause was something was using too much Java heap. So now we gotta look at the heap dumps. So you can either use the PhDs, or although I generally recommend the core dump if you can, or and for hotspot, you only have the HPROF option. And there are two tools. The, the tool that I recommend is the Eclipse Memory Analyzer tool. It's an open source tool on eclipse.org slash mat. And when you download that, then you also need to download um, the IBM DTFJ plugin. So the Eclipse Map tool that only by default uh, analyzes HPROF dumps for hotspot. And then there's a free plugin for I, from IBM to be able to parse PhDs and core dumps. So once you've installed all that, then you do file open heap dump. And uh, the one key point there is that the extension matters. So it should end in either .dmp for core dump, .phd for phd dump, and uh, .hprof for hprof. There's another tool called the IBM Heap Analyzer. I'm actually a committer on both tools. I can tell you, just in my personal opinion, there's a lot more development on Matt, and Heap Analyzer is, is kind of hasn't had much development. And uh, there are also other reasons. I generally prefer Matt. So, but if you like Heap Analyzer, it does have some uh, usability benefits. It, it can load dumps very quickly. But there's kind of a reason for that, which is that uh, Memory Analyzer runs a complex graph analysis of the um, dump and that in general can often provide better size information about how big objects are. So let's just do a little bit of theory. I won't get too deep into the theory, but uh, what I just mentioned was we always often want to know what is the size of an object. And so we do need so a little bit of theory for this. So a Java heap is just a directed graph of Java objects and the references. You've got, you know, a, a car class has an instance of a car, and that might point to a, a steering wheel object as a terrible example. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, you, you know, Java is, is basically a, a language to uh, help deal with business problems, and those are represented as Java objects. And references between objects, that's represented in the heap dump as basically you've got an object and it has these references and these fields. So at that level, it's pretty simple. But then the question is, okay, well, let's say on the left here, we have A is, let's say, an object on a thread. So it's a GC root. A GC root is something that um, makes the rest of the heap objects alive. So it's some, if it's on a thread or if it's a system class, that's something that can't be garbage collected. And so that's going to drive, um, I see a question here, is pattern modeling analysis tool for garbage collector 
PMAT still useful as GCMV. Uh, they're both uh, very good tools. And um, uh, yeah, as far as uh, GCMV versus PMAT, uh, both are good. I do like GCMV because it can, uh, I think, more easily calculate that proportion of time in GC. Now, PMAT does have a similar thing that it shows as actually a plot of uh, proportion of time in GC. And so it's a more of a preference. Whereas I would say with uh, MAT versus heap analyzer, I highly recommend using MAT. I see another question here. MAT won't load a heap dump created in text format. That is correct. The I, I do remember there was an old HPROF text dump format, but uh, I don't I don't actually know if that. I mean, nobody really uses that, but so. There may be a caveat here, but in general, no. The, the the heap dump file is not a text file. It is a binary file. Uh, all of the heap dump uh, files, the core dump, PHD, and HPROF are all binary files. All right, so so GC roots are basically, they are what anchor the entire object graph. And at the time of the dump, those are objects that can't be garbage collected because they're on a thread, et cetera. And so if you imagine in this left graph here, A is a GC root, let's say it's on a thread, and uh, it points to B and it also points to C, and then B points to D and E and so on. Now the question is, what is the size of B? So B in this example on the left is basically D, E, G, A, all the yellowish colors, because if B was garbage collected, Nothing else has references to these. So all of those must have been garbage collected if B was garbage collected. So that means we can say that the size of B is the the, the shallow size of B itself, which is going to be its fields like integers and, its, and so on, plus the sizes of D and E and so on. And in MAT, this is called the retained heap size. And it's because that is what um, all of the objects that it retains uh, when uh, as far as making them alive or dead. Now the complexity comes in on the right here where let's imagine that instead C has a reference to E. So now both B and C have a reference to E. So now the question is, what is the size of B? Well, um, it's only D, G, and K because if B was garbage collected, that would mean that D, G, and K were garbage collected, but E, H, L, and M may or may not have been garbage collected because C in, in that example is still alive. And so it, if the heap looks like this at the time of the dump and you ask what is the size of B, which is the retained heap size in MAT, then the answer is going to be D, G, and K. Now, so then you might ask, well, okay, but where are E, H, L, and M? What are they um, accounted to? And they can't be accounted to C because B it's the same uh, pattern as B. Um, B has a pointer to E, so C doesn't retain E. And so in that case, A actually, it's going to be all accounted to A. So the, the point is that retained heap is a bit of a subtle concept, but very important. And it's uh, basically the size of all of the objects that are lifetime dependent on that object. All right, so that was the theories out of the way. Now let's get into actually using the tool. So the tool is, and this is again, heap analyzer is a bit of a simpler tool, which is good and bad. Uh, Matt is, I think it is like a sports car. It does have a lot of features. It's very powerful, which I love, um, but I do understand that does make it a bit daunting and complicated at first. However, I would say about 80% of dumps only take up to three steps. You really only need to do those three steps. And in the other 20%, then you do need that extra information and it does get a little complicated. But so the first step I recommend is to run the leak suspects report. And this basically runs a bunch of heuristics to check for common likely causes of an out of memory error. And when you first open a dump, it'll actually ask you, do you wanna run the leak suspects report? And generally I would say yes. Uh, for power users, I, I actually don't run it, but uh, I think it's a great place to start and it uh, helps, especially if you're not in the tool day to day and it helps for many cases. Um, if you click cancel on that first dialog, you can also run it from the overview tab and that'll show you a, a list of suspects. And again, these are just suspects. They may just be uh, victims of some other cause, but they are a good place to start investigating. And that suspect will describe 
Uh, first of all, what is the type of that object? Which class loader is it loaded by? How much memory, in this case, about 200 megs, is held by this com IBM allocate object class? And then it'll give many details about uh, who is retaining that object and so on if you click on the details. But often you could just copy and paste this and send it to the developer that owns that code. The next step, if that didn't give you the obvious answer, is to open the dominator tree. And we'll talk a bit about what that means. In fact, if you first open a, a, a heap dump, you will see a pie chart. And that pie chart is actually just a, a, a visualization of the dominator tree. So whether you look at the pie chart or whether you click this little tree button, that's you're getting the dominator tree. So when you do that, you get in this example, again, we see that same suspect. The com IBM allocate object is retaining about 200 megs. And for a small heap, that was the main uh, cause of the issue. And I'll demo details about how to analyze that. Now, again, a little bit of theory because the dominator tree is, again, a little bit of a subtle concept. It's a very interesting uh, concept, which is not available in Heap Analyzer. And what it does is imagine, again, on the left here, you have just a normal object graph. You've got GC roots A and B. They have a reference to C. And then you have this complex object graph uh, below C. What a dominator tree is, and this is, again, partly why Matt takes a little while to parse the dump, is that it's a transformation of the heap into uh, a partitioning of uh, mutually exclusive uh, roots, uh, not necessarily roots, but uh, GC, um, I'm sorry, not GC, uh, uh, dominators that are um, splitting up the heap. And so this is a way to understand at a higher level, how do you partition the memory usage of the dump as far as what are the root objects that hold large chunks of the dump? So in this case, it has transformed um, A, B, and C into the separate dominators because A doesn't retain C because B also has a pointer to C. Uh, and the same B doesn't retain C. And so A and B, they're just on their own because they don't retain C. So they they don't dominate anything, whereas C does dominate the rest of this graph because it uh, everything is lifetime dependent on C, and so as you can see here, the C dominates a different partitioning of the set here, where D and F are separate dominator path uh, because nothing else points into D or F, and so you can try to visualize here how Matt has partitioned the memory usage into mutually exclusive sets. Uh, finally, the third step that will solve most problems is if you are using core dumps or HPROF dumps, but not PhDs, if you open the threads view, which are these little uh, gears, that will show you all the threads at the time of the dump, the uh, retained heap of each thread. This is great. I mean, if you have, let's say, just a, a DOS attack or an influx of load, and that just your thread pool is too large or your app is, is inefficient, whatever the cause may be, and you just have too many threads for the, your maximum heap size. This is a great place to check because if you saw here that you know each thread has taken 100 megs and you've got you know, 50 threads, that's you know likely the cause. And you can either reduce your thread pool or you know whatever you need, you know, optimize your app. But anyway, the point is that it shows you the retained heap per thread. And the great part is when you expand any of the threads, you get not only the stack, in this case, we've expanded this web container thread here at the top. And then here we see at and then the method name. But then we can actually, and you can see the rest of the stack at the bottom here, but you can expand any of the stack frames and you see all the Java local objects on that thread. And this is great because if you have, let's say, a out of control thread that's requesting too much heap from the database, uh, you know, the, the requesting too many results from the database, for example. Then you can see, first of all, here we see, okay, this thread's consuming five megs. That may be concerning. It's not terrible, but it's, you know, high-ish. And then we can see all of the data in the heap. So in this case, we see the actual SQL query. We see the results set. We can expand the results set object and look inside everything that's been accumulated. We can see anything the application is doing. Uh, we may even see the out-of-memory error that was thrown because uh, at the time of the dump here. So uh, this is really incredibly valuable. And this is one of the main values of core dumps. Now, as far as exploring Memory Analyzer, 
what you'll often see is this middle view here where you have an object, you have all of its references, and if it's a core dump, you'll see the actual name from the code. So in this case, if there's a person which has a field called best friend, which is another, a reference to another person. And uh, the at symbol is followed by the address of each object. You can compare if those are different objects. And then you simply explore the, the outgoing references of that graph and to understand the memory. And you generally just follow down the largest retained heap um, elements in this graph. In general, you want to skip the rows that start with the less than class greater than. Those are because every object has a pointer to its class. And so you'll pretty much see that everywhere. And unless there's a leak or some, something else going on in a static field, generally you can skip those. When you click on any object, there's this inspector view, which is on the right here. And again, if you have core dumps or HPROF, but not PHD, you will see all of the fields here and the actual value. So in this example, we've got an HTTP session. And we see, in this case, the session ID. We see the creation time as a Unix epic and so on. So you can really, as you can imagine, uh, spend hours on a core dump to find the cause if needed. And then finally, uh, I'll just, so those are the three main things you generally want to do. There are some other major things that are commonly done. The histogram, that shows you the heap usage by class. And I'll quickly demo a way to explore that, which can be very powerful. There's also the IBM extensions for memory analyzer, which are a free set of plugins that you can install on top of Matt, which provide WAS specific queries. Like for example, show me all of the WebSphere hung threads or uh, show me all the HTTP sessions, pulling out all that data, like the J session ID and the converting that Unix epic time to a wall clock time to see when the session was created and what's the timeout and so on. So there's a lot of data there. Now, one of the most common questions is, let's say you find a suspect uh, and you want to know, okay, why, uh, let's say you got an object that's 500 megs. Now you want to know why is it alive? What? And so the basic question is, the only reason an object is ever alive is because there is some garbage, one or more garbage collection routes that are um, that have a reference to that object. And so one of the ways to understand why an object is alive is to run the merge shortest paths to GC roots query. And you can right click on any object and run that. And that will find paths to GC roots. And this is particularly useful with core dumps and HPROFs, where most commonly out of memory errors are related to HTTP, JMS, EJB requests. And so that'll usually bring you to the actual thread that is driving that memory usage. So if you usually, you might start at the dominator tree, you find some object, then you would right click that, uh, find the path to GC roots, find the thread, and then usually you have your suspect. You can also investigate memory leaks with Matt by taking multiple dumps of the process, of the same process over time after a leak has occurred. You can load both dumps in Matt and then there's a button in the histogram to compare the histograms between two dumps. So you can say, for example, there are a hundred megabytes more of byte arrays and that's likely our leak. Finally, there's a very powerful thing called the object query language, which is a SQL-like querying language where you can uh, run queries on the dump that um, I can demo pretty quickly. So what I'm gonna do is do a little demo here and then we'll get to, Q well, I'll leave plenty of time for Q&A. So I will bring up Matt. This is the main screen of Matt. Usually I close the welcome screen and I click file, open heap dump. And here I'm gonna select, I have a core dump. I've already parsed this dump before. So it's gonna actually, if I click on the progress bar here, it says reopening parsed heap dump file. And so it, it was very quick if you've already opened it before. As I mentioned, you can click the leak suspects report to run that immediately. Or if you just click cancel, you can run that from here. So I'll start there. And this, let me expand this a little bit. So here we have, so first of all, I should mention on the overview page, the size here is the amount of live heap usage at the time of the dump. In this case, we have a small heap size, but the, that, this means that 
at the time of the dump, at the time of the out of memory, there was 287 megabytes of live heap usage and the uh, JVM heap was consumed. And so we went out of memory. So, you know, in this case, this isn't very realistic because most customers have larger heaps. But in this case, we, the leak suspects will do a pie chart showing uh, it's the leak suspect compared to the rest of the heap. So 187, that's most of the heap. And then here we see com IBM allocate object loaded by the class order. Usually it doesn't, you can kind of skip this little piece, but then it says it occupies 187 megs, which is 65%. And then when you click details, this gives you, first of all, the path to the accumulation point. So if you start, um, if you look here, we've got that com IBM allocate object, and then it thinks that it might be related to this thread. Now, in this case, this is a bad example for the most common usage that customers see because this is actually, a, um, the leak is in a static in the because you can see here it says class. So this data, this holder object is holding this array list, which is 187 megs, but this is in a static field. And so some of the, you know, a lot of these things in Matt are gonna be heuristics. They're not gonna be perfect um, because of the, there's just no way to know for sure. Um, so in this case, it, it's not helpful, but it, if it was caused by a thread going out of control, this would be the thread name usually, and that'll give you details about which thread. And now what's great is uh, let's assume for the sake of argument that that was a thread that had driven it. You can actually then click on any of these hyperlinks, but if we were usually interested in the thread, so we can click on that thread object and pretty much anything you click on in Matt has this pop-up. And again, it's a little intimidating at first, but it's very powerful. And in this case, we wanna see, okay, we got a thread. So let's go and see under Java basics, thread overview and stacks. That's gonna give us that same thread view, but zoomed into just this thread. And so we can immediately see it has, it's only retaining 47 kilobytes, which again, goes back to the fact that it's kind of a, a false positive because it, it was, the leak is in a, a static field. But in any case, you see, again, the, the full stack and we can look inside the stack. There are lots of other information here in the leak suspect report. In this case, we can actually see very clear details of what's driving this out of memory. In this case, we've got, again, this static allocate object uh, field. It's, it's got an array list. And if you scroll right here, you can see it's 187 megs. And then we have a bunch of these byte arrays that are each about a megabyte. And so you can see this big drop between the array list and these byte arrays. And that is one of the heuristics Matt uses to suspect certain potential leaks where there's this big uh, drop. There's what's called an accumulation point where you know, it's usually an array list or a hash map. And that's often a case of um, some sort of leak or, or excessive memory usage. And so that's the leak suspects report. Uh, by default, it'll actually create a uh, zip file with an HTML report with that full leak suspects report. So the second thing I mentioned is the dominator tree, and you can either left click on the pie chart and look at a particular object, usually with outgoing references, uh, list objects with outgoing references. So I might do that, and here we've got that com IBM allocate object, and here we've got 187 megabytes. So we expand that. And again, you'll see usually a lot of information, but what you wanna do is follow the retained heap column. And so if we look down here, you know, this is actually, uh, this is pointing back to itself. And here we've got this array list. That's our suspect we wanna follow down. And then we just kind of keep following the, the retained heap column. And in this case, we can quickly see the issue. Okay, we've got an array list with a bunch of one megabyte byte arrays. That's our leak. I'll save uh, the question pending there for Q&A. And you can also click a dominator tree view. Now this is different. So if I expand this, you'll see a little bit of a different data. And this is because the dominator tree is a transformation of the heap. Whereas when I click uh, on any object and I do list objects with outgoing references or incoming references, that's a pure, you know, true fact of what was what are the references in the heap at that time? Whereas the dominator tree is a transformation. So it's gonna be a little bit different, um, but it's it's great to have that sort of different view. And it's that partitioning of the heap where, okay, we got this allocate object. We've got some sort of cache using seven megs, um, some sort of SIB message store. So it's a good way to partition the view. And then finally, I know we're coming up on Q and A here. We've got the threads view, which is that third step that I recommend for most issues. 
And we've got all of our threads. You know, Liberty has default executor threads. It's by default sorted by the retained heap column. So you'll always want to check that. These are small. So the, in this case, I would conclude it's not likely related to the active threads at the time. But then you expand any of the threads and you can then look inside. So I think we can stop there and go to Q&A. So I'll start with the question pending there, which is, is there an executable jar file for the memory analyzer like there is for the heap analyzer? Yes. So if you go to um, eclipse.org, let me bring my browser in here. So if you go to eclipse.org, or, oh, geez, I can't type. I'm not used to my uh, Mac. All right, so you go to Mac, click on download, and there are executables for every operating system. And so you would download for Windows, Linux, or Mac. The only additional step is you do need to add that IBM DTFJ plugin, but it's actually already in the drop down. I can show you real quick here. So once you install Matt, you click help install new software and it pre-populates the IBM DTFJ plugin. So you just go in here, you click help update, add new software, click this option, check the box if you accept the license and then it'll install restart Matt. And so it's a, a, a slightly more complicated than the heap analyzer to start, but otherwise generally straightforward. Any other questions, Marika? Um, yes. Uh, can we export or create a heap dump Java core from dot uh, dump file using Matt? So there is, in fact, a new feature um, in Matt one point eleven. I know there's some work around that. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what the question means because it could be interpreted a few ways. So can you acquire a heap dump from within Matt? Uh, Murky, you may want to go mute. Uh, I'm getting a little feedback, thanks. Um, you can actually, from Matt, if the process is on the same host as Matt, then you can actually select the JVM and take a heap dump, and it'll just import it right into Matt. Now, as far as can you export um, the file from Matt, I need to look that up. I believe um, one of the developers of Matt just recently added something like that. So I'll, I will take a look at that. If you want to send me an email, kevin.greekrenko.us.ibm.com, I can follow up with you on that. Um, OK, so yeah, uh, there is a question also asking that for sharing slides and live session video. Yes, uh, the slides, you can download it from the top plus. Uh, and uh, the, this session is going to turn into a recording. Uh, so you will have, uh, you can visit the same URL and you will have the recording of the session uh, after this call. So uh, let's, uh, let me go. There is another question. Um, how much memory does it take to load a dump in Matt? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, unfortunately, that is one of the major limitations of any memory analysis, whether it's MAD or Heap Analyzer, although MAD does tend to use more memory. So generally speaking, you will need, uh, oh, so it's actually hard to say for sure because the amount of heap used is actually dependent on the complexity of the object graph. So you could actually have a pretty small heap, but if you have a lot of tiny objects that are all pointing to each other, that data has to be represented in Matt, and so that can consume a lot of memory. So it's, the, the answer is it depends, unfortunately, but in general, you will need multiple gigabytes at least. And if let's say your heap dump is 10 gigs, uh, I mean, let's say your, your maximum heap size is 10 gigs or so, then you will probably need something like that in Matt. You can sometimes do it less. You may sometimes need more. Um, so you will definitely need a very powerful machine in for most production analysis situations. What I generally recommend is that uh, because most workstations are either, you know, in today's world, we actually rarely can even download the dumps to our workstations uh, in IBM and I'm sure in many customers. So in fact, it, usually you're 
going to be doing it in Citrix or something like that. And so what I recommend is having a some sort of uh, pool of central servers that your company has where you can remote into it using remote desktop or VNC. And then that server is a really beefy production ser like server that has, you know, 64 gigs of RAM and you can run Matt with a lot of heat. Um, I, I got another uh, question here, uh, Kevin. Uh, what is the recommendation to analyze huge heaps? So it could either be with that sort of very large remote machine. The other option you can do is Matt does have a way to run the parser in headless mode. So if let's say you don't have GUI access to some beefy machine, you could still run it from the command line. Then you can take Matt when it parses a dump, it creates index files in the same directory as the dump. And so you can parse it headless on some really beefy server, then download those index files to either another server that has GUI or your workstation, and then try to load it there with a much smaller heap. Now, you may still need quite a bit of heap, but that may be one way to avoid, because some things Matt can essentially page out to the index files. And so you may be able to get away with that. Um, okay, um, I do have a question as well here. Uh, does the Matt tool show what's in the tenured region or only live objects? So by default, Matt performs when you load a dump in Matt, and this is again, another, I think, good feature that Heap Analyzer doesn't have is that it performs a virtual garbage collection. And so that's again, part of the reason why Matt takes a while to load. It will essentially do a full GC. And so what you see in Matt by default is you see only live Heap usage. And what's interesting is you can see this link here, unreachable objects histogram. And if you click on that, that is actually what was in uh, what the gar any garbage that was in the tenure heap. Now, in the case of uh, heap exhaustion out of memory errors, this is usually not going to be much because usually the, G the JVM just ran a GC, failed, and then threw an out of memory error. So you're unlikely to see much in the tenured heap for a, a, an exhaustion out of memory error. But if, let's say, you took a heap dump manually, which, by the way, you should be careful to do because if you take a heap dump manually for sizing analysis or whatever, um, it will pause the JVM for usually dozens of seconds. So just be careful of that. But in that case, you would see any garbage that's in the tenure region in this unreachable objects histogram. There is actually a way under Matt, if you, for whatever reason, wanted to look at those that data within Matt itself, you can go under Matt preferences and click keep unreachable objects. Um, I generally, don't do that, and I don't recommend it. And make sure to remember to uncheck that if you do use that for future analysis. I also see a question here. Um, can we find native memory leaks using MAT on dump files? So memory native memory leaks are a huge another topic, and I should do a talk on that at some point. It's less common of an issue for customers. but So the answer is yes, there is quite a bit of data uh, for native memory leaks in MAT. Uh, one of the queries in the IBM extensions for memory analyzer, if so, if you have that installed, it's under IBM extensions, Java runtime, direct byte buffers. And that will tell you, particularly this line here, the native memory used by direct byte buffers, either for those, the first line is uh, the ones that are only phantomly reachable, which would mean that uh, a subsequent full GC will clear those direct byte buffer um, phantom references and their native backing, uh, or those that are strongly um, referenced, in which case those are just direct buffers using native memory. So it, as far as native memory, it's a big topic. But yes, there is some data in core dumps. But in general, you'll want to actually start with the Java core and start with the um, native mem info section. And there you start to look at, okay, what's driving? Is it classes? Now, this, let's say, for example, you have a class loader native memory leak, then you will need MAD because then you'll want to look at, okay, which class loaders are leaked. So maybe there's a, you know, the application was restarted 
And that's often where the path to GC roots query comes in. And let me quickly show that because it is incredibly valuable. So let's say I am looking at the dominator tree, for example. And let's say I've got this cache here. So this is Derby, some sort of database cache. So I want to know what is keeping this object alive? This is a really important question. So if I right click and I do merge shortest path to GC roots, and generally speaking, you want to do this ex exclude all phantom weak soft, et cetera, references. And what that means is you really just want to look at strong references that are strongly um, uh, referencing that a path to that object. So if you click, usually you want to click that option and then you expand that and you can kind of look at this backwards. You can start at the, at the leaf object. So here's that cache again. That cache has a strong reference from this Derby store, you know, base data factory, which has a strong reference from this exact raw trans uh, object, which has this RAM transaction. And so, and then that has a strong reference from this thread. So now this, we have now answered, why is this object alive? It's because of this thread. And so what we could do is then right click on that thread, Java basics, thread overview and stacks. We can then expand that thread. And then, you know, you won't immediately be able to find that. You'll have to search around, but you'll be looking for this RAM transaction class. That's a local on one of the frames. So if you just explore those frames, you know, I won't take too much time if I can't find it immediately. But anyway, it'll be somewhere in here. And then you can then look at the other objects. You can look at the overall stack. What else is happening on that thread? You'll be able to see things like if you keep expanding down, um, you'll see this is a this is an MDB. So we've got an MDB coming in here, it looks like. And then you can see, oh wait, no, there's a WebSocket, I'm sorry. So you got, you got a WebSocket come in, so you expand that. You can have, you see you know, database information, things like that. Um, so Kevin, um, have we answered the question, a heap analyzer always runs out of a heap when processing a large heap dump files, what can be done? Yeah, that basically you, you just need a bigger machine in that case. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, we do have three more minutes. Um, let me ask this question here. I, I downloaded Matt, but I couldn't load IBM dumps such as uh, PhD, PhDs or core dumps, even though I was running Matt with IBM Java. What am I doing wrong? Right. So that uh, is partly answered, but I'll, I'll elaborate on it. That You do need to add this IBM DTFJ plugin to be able to load core dumps and PhDs. I will also note there is some development happening now. Uh, we're not sure if it's going into the product or not, but yeah, there's some work to allow you to not to not require this IBM DTFJ plugin. And if you're running IBM Java or OpenJ9, it'll just load DTFJ from the JVM. And so it, hopefully in the future, um, if all goes well with that patch, you will simply be able to download from Eclipse.org, uh, run it with IBM Java or OpenJ9, and load IBM Java or OpenJ9 dumps. Um. Okay, so let me ask this as the last question, uh, since we have two more minutes. Can I see exactly what an object is retaining that sums up to its uh, retained size? Yeah, great question. So if we go back to, let's say, the dominant chain, we, we want to ask, what is, so this concurrent cache, it's seven megs of retained heap. What is actually in there? I mean, we could explore it, but this could be, you know, very long and complicated to explore, and it's hard to add things up. So any object in Matt, if you right click, and you do show retain set and just click finish, it'll show a histogram, a class histogram of what is that seven megabytes made up of. So in here we see at the bottom the total seven megs and it'll sort by the shallow heap of each class, uh, the sum of, of that class in that retain heap. And so we can quickly say, okay, this cache is seven megs and 3.8 is bytes, uh, byte arrays. And then we got some Derby objects. So this is a great way to break down the retained heap of an object. And that can give you good hypotheses about what might be driving that memory. Um, okay, so we actually, we have reached to the end of uh, this uh, session or webinar. Um, 
we can still use the chat box to answer your questions. Uh, you can put them there. Uh, even that we're ending uh, this uh, webinar, I would like um, Kevin to thank you for providing us with such an enlightening and educational session on how to deal with the out of memory errors as it is one of the five top Java issues customers are encountering today. Uh, as well, I would like to thank you uh, all for attending this episode and providing us with your questions and feedback. Before we end this episode, I'd like to note that this episode will soon turn into a recording, which would allow you to share it with your colleagues. Thank you and have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.